Amit has totally blown up on the scene of Palantir. His channel is great. You guys should check it out. He covers Palantir in depth. He was supposed to talk with us today, but he's going to talk with us next week. You'll still see his face. He just won't be real time until next week, guys. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let's just share right now our Discord where we do talk about Palantir, but let's go to Kathy Wood in particular. I've been tracking her sales and she started selling heavily. This is February 17, 2022. So a couple of days ago, right? She sold 3.8 million and people went crazy that she's selling Palantir. They're like, okay, this is happening but maybe it's because she found other deals that are better or they felt that other stocks fell more. So she's doing that. But next day she sold 10 million. So now she went from, I think around 35 million shares to 12 million. So she sold over half of her position in Palantir. To anyone following Kathy Wood, this puts a lot of pressure on the stock itself. Look how big her sales are when she actually dumps a position. You mentioned Kathy Woods and I wanted to get your take on this thesis that I Oh, so we're going straight to Kathy? Because it relates to Palantir. Before we begin discussing Palantir, guys hit the like and subscribe and please Hit that bell. Ding, ding, ding. I'm feeling like Kathy Wood is becoming the victim of her own success. And one of the reasons she was able to beat the markets in 2020 is because she was able to make her trades in relative anonymity and watch it play out the way that she said. But now that she's so popular and people know and talk about every single trade that she makes and the market has personal feelings towards Kathy, I feel like it's going to be almost impossible for her to match or even beat any of those sorts of returns from 2020 because any negativity that would be directed towards her is taken out on the companies that she's promoting like a Palantir. I agree with you. She's a victim of her own success and when she was making the Tesla calls back in 2019 or 2018, I forgot her $3,000, $4,000 price targets. Everybody and their mother was laughing at her. Even I was buying Tesla, I was like, that's never going to happen. <laughs> and you're a and, bull, right? And you're a bull. And I'm a bull, right? And it's, what is it, 5000 now? What is it post-split? It's around $5,000. It beat her own expectation, in fact. So I think she could be very right about these certain companies. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter because now we have to wait five years to find out. And CNBC and most investors don't have patience to wait five years. So you're right. The only thing they can do is basically laugh at her again. But if she gets proven the second time around for any of these things, she is going to be the goat. We're going to follow her like Warren Buffett everywhere she goes. They're also, I'm sure you've heard of this S Arc, which is shorting Kathy Wood's mm -hmm. stock. It's not a huge fund. It's not as big as hers, but they're literally just betting against, against her. her stocks for no other reason than they're her stocks. That wasn't <laughs> around in 2020 is my point. It's going to be really hard for her to repeat that. And so if you're following her now, how do you factor that in? I, I don't know what the answer is. If anyone has any thoughts on this, please comment below. Tell us down there in the comments, are you still buying Kathy Wood's uh, funds? I want to know. She's managing a fund. The reasons why she moves money around is really different. What you're saying reminds me a lot when she first started selling Tesla. Remember? And they were like, oh, missed $7,000 a share. Why are you selling? She's like, well, I can't have it be more than 10% of my portfolio. We're up a tremendous amount. You have the responsibility to capture some of that profit for the owners of the ETF. But Tesla ran up. Palantir is running down. So she's lost approximately half her value on those shares and she's selling, which shows either one of two things. She's lost all faith in Palantir. Uh -huh. And that's why she's, this position might be going to zero, by the way. That's what I think is happening. Or number two, there's just better deals. And she just doesn't, she believed in it, but she believes in Zoom or Roku. Right. But do you think that in the same way that she has a say, if a company becomes more than 10% of the fund, I sell. Do you not think she has those same sort of like stop losses on the back end? No, it's not like that with her. At least she says it's not like that because remember she says, I have the five-year plan. I don't right. care what happens within the interim, but if her thesis on a company has changed, that's when she's willing to take that 50% loss tax harvest that money because now oh, that's another good point. maybe it's that but why would you sell palantir or most of your position and then go into someone like tdoc or roku or zoom because you think they're going to do better let's face it she thinks they're going to do better than this guy that's the bottom line another option could just simply be she thinks there's better prices coming she's trying to protect the owners of the fund from having to ride that dip again she is managing other people's money you know when you talk to friends you give them i would say much more conservative advice than you would take yourself if you're managing your kids money you would be much more conservative than you would be with your own money. I think that there's some level of that at play. It could be right. And we won't know until maybe a year from now how this plays out because right. you're right. Let's say Palantir falls to seven bucks, mm. whatever the bottom is. And at that point, she starts piling heavily back into Palantir. Then her long game is still intact. She yeah. just felt that was a short-term move. But everything she says is she's not a short-term trader. But everything she's showing is she might be a short-term trader. I don't know. Basically, government contracts decrease quarter over quarter for this year. Kathy Wood said that she is not happy the quarter over quarter growth of the government contract has gone down. But if you look at just their growth, they are growing in terms
terms of TTM revenue, net dollar retention, by the way, this is important. Even if they didn't grow, the actual retention of the dollars is growing by itself. They are actually growing 41% total revenue growth year over year. I don't know, total revenue growth of 41% still seems like a really high growing. I don't think that'd be the, a good enough reason. Let me put it this way. But then again, I'm not dealing with 50 million in Palantir money. I'm dealing with my thousand shares that I've lost half value on. <laughs> a lot of people who are watching this channel might know who Palantir is, but let's actually go and show who Palantir is because we're talking about them. But does anyone really know what they do? Carlos, can you actually tell me what they do on a day-to-day -day basis? It's interesting because I'm not as versed in Palantir. And my first question was, what do they do? Foundational software of tomorrow delivered today. Okay, she's looking at some stuff and some cells. We build software that <laughs> empowers organizations to effectively integrate their data, decisions, and operations. Okay. Based on that and watching the recent earnings calls, what I understand that they do is they are a service that allows you to take tremendous amounts of data and parse it with very low latency that allows humans to make functional decisions. Machine learning and AI between the data because a human cannot go through this much data anymore that right. by themselves. Right. Can't go so through you it. can't have a big Excel spreadsheet and go through it. You need a machine learning algorithm to go through that data. Having said that, what do they do every day? It's not easy to parse a company like this out because they are so secretive. They are mostly government contracts. So they can't even tell you what they actually do with those people. Amit had a recent video on his channel where he had an expert, the guy Coach Trap. So Amit, we're throwing this out to you. Thanks for posting this yes, video. Yes, Amit course. couldn't be here. We actually did want to discuss this with him and maybe we will when he's here in person. Let's get into Palantir. Why do you think Palantir can change the world? So there's a future that's emerging and in that future AI is everywhere and we start to see a little bit today like it's in your microwave, it's on your stove, it's on your phone but this is just the precursor. These are like the kind of the dumb models. The future edge AI that's coming will actually be able to make changes in the real world. So like right now, all the AI does is typically make a recommendation to a human. But in the future, edge AI will act autonomously, right? So like whether that's changing the direction of wind blades on a turbine or changing the production of an oil rig or letting you know when your food is done, <laughs> right? Like, like edge AI will actually be impacting the real world the way it doesn't today. And that's going to transform our lives. I mean, just think about cars. We've always dreamed of cars that could drive in unison to avoid traffic. Well, edge AI can enable that sort of thing, right? So like there's anomaly detection that can automatically order maintenance service in factories before bearings break down or before parts, you know, fail. Like this, future is rapidly approaching and Palantir has worked backwards from this future starting you know 10 years ago figuring out what tools and what products are going to be required in order to operate in that future and also what philosophies and management structures are required to make sure that technology isn't misused because if we look today companies like Google and Facebook have done a phenomenal job monetizing personal data the social consequences be damned that Palantir is also the right company from a philosophical managerial perspective to not allow the power of edge AI to be misused in the same way social media and you know ad serving technology has been misused today. They're the right company to do it specifically because they've worked backwards from this problem, both from a technical perspective and from a kind of philosophical perspective. And they did it a long time ago. A lot of it is understandable what he says, like cars, that's the edge. Yeah. That's where AI should be happening somewhere on the car, not in some server in Amazon, on the car, on your phone. So I get what he's saying and I agree with him. That's where it's going, but I'm going to slow this down. Palantir is not doing that today. I, I, and people are going to, uh, people might be hitting up the comments right now. <laughs> I think, I think right codes, now, codes is... I don't believe they're doing that right now. I'm not saying they're not integrating a lot of stuff, but that's where it's headed. What is happening now? So I'm curious if someone in the comments knows more about this post, do they do this kind of stuff right now where they can actually make decisions based on the data alone, or there's still some human involved in that process. And I think even Alex Karp likes the fact that a human is involved in making the decisions. I don't know if he actually wants machines just to take over, by the way. What they're describing is Skynet. I mean, this is how, this is how <laughs> this Skynet, is Skynet took over the world. You slowly give it more authority to make bigger decisions because you trust right. what the software is going to do to the point where it thinks that you're the problem and then becomes self-aware and gets rid of you. So there's a, a, bit, a little bit scary in that sense, right? Because it's just a permissions check away from being able to do really destructive things. But anybody has any idea or working examples of Palantir software in action in a company today, that'd be great. Someone put it on Reddit. These aren't all the companies for Palantir, but these are a lot of companies in Palantir that are being used. And you can see UK Royal Navy, US ICE, US Air Force, US SEC. I guess the blue ones are all like the military, right? USASA, USGC, UK Gov, DOE. We have other companies too, but I'm pointing out the fact that, look, Palantir has a lot of business 
from from the government. This is like the weird thing that I thought we were against the government. And I thought a lot of investors were like, I don't want the government to spy on us. I'm not sure if we're all supposed to be so heavily behind a company that's providing services for possible spying against its populace. How Peter Thiel's Palantir helped the NSA spy on the whole world. Do you know Palantir? Because Palantir knows you, <laughs> okay? So there's all of this negativity, just like we even discussed Facebook at length, right? Nobody likes Facebook. This is one of your things. They're an evil company. Yeah. We don't like the Chinese because they're not a great investment thesis. And why do we buy Neo? It seems like everybody else in the YouTube sphere is not discussing this who's heavy into Palantir. And I own shares. Let's make it clear, okay? Yeah. Palantir has never masked its ambitions, in particular desire to sell its services to the US government. In fact, 60%, maybe even more percent, is government contracts. The CIA itself was an early investor in the startup. That's how they started. Oh, that is. Startup through NQTEL, the agency's venture capital branch, but Palantir refuses to discuss or even name its government clientele despite landing at least 1.2 billion in federal contracts since 2009. And I'm not saying believe this 100% face value, but that's how they started. We cannot move away from the fact that they were funded by the CIA. Peter Thiel is okay with this, obviously. According to an August 2016 report in Politico, the company was last valued at $20 billion and expected to pursue an IPO. This is before the IPO. In a 2012 interview with TechCrunch, while boasting of ties to the intelligence community, Carp said non-disclosure contracts prevent him from speaking about Palantir's government work. This goes back to the fact, will we ever know what Palantir does? Is there software that they develop possible just specifically for the government that we'll never have access to for the commercial side? What I would say, trying to play the middle or do the counterpoint is, I think what's appealing to investors about this source of revenue revenue is that they know that the government doesn't have quarterly earnings or they just print the money. And so if you're participating in that gravy train, it's a pretty guaranteed stream of revenue. And I think if you're investing in Palantir for the returns and you know that 60% of their money comes from government contracts, you're going to be okay. You are okay with the NSA paying them and the CIA paying them because it's not that Palantir is spying on you. I'm not saying that. I don't think they are. I don't think the company itself is spying on anybody. But if they're supporting the infrastructure and they have engineers at the CIA, the NSA, the, the military, you know those engineers have access to private information. They, they have to. There's no other way around it. People hate Facebook for this very thing, that yeah. they have all this data on you. And now you're saying it's okay to invest in Palantir because they sort of have this data on you? Sort of. I, I don't know. What's the word? It feels like... Hypocritical. Un... Okay, that's the word. You're being, a, you're being a hypocrite. Palantir has direct connections and communication with the government. It's not hiding that fact. Yet the public perception of that relationship is not as negative as, say, Facebook's relationship. Right. And Facebook is not funded by the government. And their primary business and primary clientele is not the government. I see a lot of Palantir fans, and they talk about all of the good things Palantir is doing. And nobody's talking about like the negative side, that a lot of their software could be used. And maybe it's to protect the United States, which we want, but maybe some of it is is not. We don't know. Palantir does not make all this money with the NSA and the CIA and the military only because it's cookies, candies, and strawberries. Yeah. Like It's the way it is, man. Okay, so we're talking about Carp. In a Forbes profile of 2013, he played privacy lamb saying, I didn't sign up for the government to know when I smoke a joint or have an affair. This is Carp talking, okay? So I like what he's saying here. We have to find places that we protect away from the government so that we can all be in a unique and interesting and in my case, somewhat deviant people we'd like to be. Palantir's mission with privacy in mind to reduce terrorism while preserving civil liberties. It's hard to square this purported commitment to privacy with proof garnered with documents provided by Edward Snowden, remember that guy? That Palantir has helped expand and accelerate the NSA's global spy network, which is jointly administrated with allied foreign agencies around the world. Notably, the partnership has included building software specifically to facilitate, augment, and accelerate the use of X-Keyscore, one of the most expansive and potentially intrusive tools in the NSA's arsenal. So. Once again, I don't know. I don't know what the truth is. I, you know, I'm just trying to dig up information. What's Palantir do? Are they good? Are they bad? And Edward Snowden pops in there and I'm like, Ugh. A subsequent report by The Intercept showed that X key scores collected communications not only include emails, chats, and web browsing traffic, but also pictures, documents, voice calls, webcam photos, web searches, advertising analytic traffic, social media traffic, botnet traffic, log keystrokes, computer network, exploitation targeting, intercepted username and password pairs, file uploads to online services, Skype sessions, and more. For the NSA and its global partners, X key score makes all of this as searchable as a hotel reservation site. Well, thank you, Palantir. I'm an investor. I'm not selling my shares, but nobody's covering this. Nobody is on any Palantir discussion forum talking about maybe there are negatives to this company. Maybe it's not all a sunshine and roses. The comments are going to blow up by oh, the no, way. They're, they they're are, just they like, but this is, but this is, good. this is good. This is the, <laughs> then, well, then, the obvious question to you is how are you okay with it with Facebook and why are you 
about it on Palantir's side? You're okay with it on Facebook? That's a good question. Totally treating these as investments, by the way. I'm not treating it as my morality should be totally in charge. If I did that, then I can't even buy the S&P. I don't believe in cigarettes. I don't believe in gas stations. All of it has to go out the window. At what point do I say, dude, at some point you're in America, capitalism is working. Try not to mess with that too much. If Palantir is going to succeed, which it can, people have to be honest with themselves that Palantir is not the be end all be all greatest company in the world. And it's also not the most evil. They're probably just trying to do what they can to make money, to make the world a better place. And they can't control that the NSA how they use the how they use the data how the cia exactly uses the data they can't control that just on the bit of research that i've done for me with a different ceo i might believe that the company has a more positive mission at its core but i don't believe this ceo and i think so you I, don't think alex carp is deep down good guy at the end of it i don't want to make a personal judgment about the guy but what i would say is i don't believe he's being truthful mm. my issue would be that it's not that i don't believe him it's that i feel like he's talking to me like i'm an idiot it's so highfalutin. Tell me how this works. Exactly what exactly you're doing. How much exactly you're making. How many cogs do you have in the machine? I feel like I can't get that information without parsing six hours of your footage. You're right. And I'm not even going to answer that. I'm going to let this guy answer because he's literally about to answer you. All right. So I'm going to let this guy answer your question about being able to explain what your company does. This is Alex Hormozzi. a great guy. This guy, I just love the way he talks. He said this. And when I watched the Q4 interview, it reminded me of this moment with him. I always start, and this is a very true, every single person in my company would know this, especially my finance team. Like when we hop on calls with like experts and all this stuff, I always say the same thing. I say, hey, I just want you to pretend you're explaining the structure to a golden retriever, all right, who speaks Spanish, all right? Pictures, simple words, I want to understand. And if someone cannot explain something to you simply, it's either because they're trying to confuse you or they do not understand it fully. Think about that. People, if you are confused and someone cannot explain something simply to you, it is because either they do not understand it or it is because of their desire to confuse you and seem intelligent. Neither of those scenarios are good for you. So if they cannot explain it to you visually and simply, I would say run the other way, all right? Because either they don't have the right intentions or they don't have the right skill level of skill. You know, you can go to any question by Alex Carp. If anybody's listened to this guy for longer than 10 minutes, he does not answer your question with a straightforward answer. This is the first question that was asked of him on the call. Yeah, thanks so much for fielding my question. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, first and foremost, congratulations on all the hard work. It seems like you guys have a great team and are executing really well. Uh, from a retail investor perspective, the most negative sentiment I hear regarding Palantir is in regards to the dilution of shares outstanding over the past uh, 12 to 18 months, and primarily in relation to stock-based compensation that's occurred. Other than the remaining shares to be vested that have already been announced, can we expect uh, further dilution and share offerings going forward, or is it kind of reasonable to assume that uh, the majority of this was from the IPO process and sort of a one-time uh, event for the company? Once again, thanks and congratulations on all the hard work and business developments. Thank you, and um, I really appreciate you uh, investors. Uh, thanks for investing uh, and the faith you have in us. Um, okay, so there's, there's, there's like the simple version, which I think you know, it's like, so there's really, there's stock-based comp and there's dilution. The dilution thing, that's a red herring. We're, we're not issuing a lot of new shares. I think it's like in the $9 million range. Yep. And so it would be a little coy of me to say, uh, that's like no issue, move on. The, 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 the thing to understand about Palantir, and then I'll, I want to just hit this, is like, it's actually not the result of the DPO. It's the result of the fact that we were completely focused on building product. We had no earthly idea we were going to DPO to like, right before we did it. And so most companies are, I mean, quite frankly, built so that the, you know, when analysts look at it, the primary customer of most software companies is not the client, it's the software analyst. So it's like, we, we obviously, our primary client are our clients, which doesn't mean, you know, and now we're thinking about how do we expose the data in a way that, you know, people on the outside like you and professional analysts and others can look at the data and get a better sense of what's tracking, what's not tracking. But the primary source of a lot of these like questions really comes down to, look, we built the company to support the U.S. warfighter primarily and then do take dual use it for the glory of humanity, particularly humanity in the West. And that was our idea. And because that the primary, our primary client was not what uh, you know, someone at a hedge fund would think. We didn't actually think of these things from inception. And so, so now there's a process of normalization. You're gonna see that. Okay, I just wanna stop it right there because 
we're not getting the answer to the question. And now we're talking about what Palantir does, and he's making a case for why to continue investing in it now. The original question was dilution. I think he's getting to an answer. Like, but this is this is my problem. Even if he gets there, why do I have to wait five minutes for this answer? He never gets there. He's getting to the point that we are growing as a company. We didn't start out 20 years ago when they started or 15, whatever it was. They weren't thinking about these things. Like, I get what he's saying. I'm, I'm not actually saying that he doesn't make any sense. My point is he spent five minutes not getting to the point. We're just saying the dilution is going to continue for the next year or two because we have stock-based compensation happening. That's true. But after that, it's going away. We're going to the moon. Thank you very much. You tell me, if your company's main mission is to reduce the latency between the time of making decisions and improve efficiency, how can you be that inefficient as the CEO with your own words? He is not a tech CEO, and that is another issue I have with him. He is not a tech CEO. Yes, he runs a tech company now, and they do AI. My question to him is, where's the WAS? Who is the WAS here? The Woz? Because he's not the WAS. Yeah. He's the Steve Jobs, which is cool. We need Steve Jobs. It where's worked. the WAS? It worked. Steve Jobs yeah. and Steve Waz worked. I want to That's know who funny. that guy is. I want him to come to the meeting and talk about Palantir for a little bit because just, just give me full technical. Give mm. me everything you're doing inside the company. Tell me the actual numbers of everything. I don't want to hear 15 minutes of possibly getting to an answer. Maybe someday. I want to hear the Waz. That's well, that. And, well, I, now, and in our Discord, in our Discord, if you join it at this point, <laughs> that we are talking about this exact same thing. I want to know who is the guy behind the curtain who's actually implementing the complicated stuff like machine learning, AI algorithms, all of this stuff. There's got to be someone in charge there. It can't be him because I don't think he knows the low level technical implementation of any of this. I'm calling it out right now. I don't think he knows that stuff. I think at the end of the day, investors just want direct answers to their questions. And if you can't be direct, what it makes me think is, what is this guy like in meetings? As we saw, I was able to distill the Starship one hour and whatever minute thing down to 35 minutes without cutting out any content. It was just zip filed, you know, like compressed down and you realize out of an hour and a half, you have 35% of content. So you could say Elon Musk is 66% less efficient with his words than he could be. This guy is like in the 15% range in terms of density of information per minute. The bits of the answer are floating on the top of these massive word salad. And that makes me wonder if an engineer comes to you with a question, are you going to sit there and hammer them for a half an hour when it's just a yes or a no? That so makes me question the efficiency of the company. Okay, so we can't keep talking about how, obviously, the negatives of Palantir. The only reason we brought it up here, I just want to be clear, is that a lot of people are not talking about what we are discussing here right now, that there's a lot of negatives mm. to the company itself, Palantir, as well as to others like Facebook and even Enphase. We can find things that are negative about companies. Investors have to face reality. And I feel like the Palantir community, it's not 100% positive. There is like 50% positive and 50% negative. And I just, I feel like we, we want to give also the negative side because everybody seems to be covering the positive side, right? Just for the record, it's not being negative for the sake of being negative. It's entertaining and accepting that there are some negatives because if you ignore them, you're ignoring a potential risk to your investment. And that's what it comes down to. This is not personal. This is about you're giving this guy 10, 15, 20, $30,000 of your money. It's irresponsible not to have some of the negative risk on your radar. I'm doing my research now, which I should have done a year ago. I still have my shares. I'm not selling anything. I just want everybody to be honest with it. So let's go to some good because there is a lot of good here. So this is some good. Let's hear at the beginning of that same earnings call. And let's hear from uh, from Carp's own words, what he says about his company. And it actually makes me more positive on what he says. When Palantir began, people believed that data was worthless, that software was a luxury item, and that we would fail. And one of the very interesting things that's happened to Palantir is we've been able to see how the world has changed dramatically in its perception of software and, of course, of us, from a world where software was something that you might be in your car but de facto would not determine your business to a world where really the laws of finance are going to be rewritten to deal with a world where the only real moat is software. How do you measure it? What does it look like? How do you understand when it's creating value? How do you understand when it's declining in value? How do you understand when it's compounding? To what extent is it compounding? What d devices do we use to measure that? Are the devices we use to measure it the ones that we used in the past? Clearly, this industry is in its infancy. What's also very special about this industry is it really is, by and large, geographically located in a small section of America, uh, which is odd, and there's lots of interesting reasons for that, but enterprise software is something that America is by far the best at. What we see currently at Palantir, it's not just the best at building it, it seems to also be the best at understanding what software developments are relevant for the world today and adapting even when it's being offered by a company that in every way looks non-standard, run by people that are very different, look different, feel different, talk differently, and with a CEO that many view as batshit crazy. 
And I think that's a good part to stop. I agree with his main point. Software is eating the world. AI is eating the world. We know this is happening. That kind of stuff actually makes me bullish about Palantir. No matter what negatives we spin on on some of this stuff, his company and companies like his, like Snowflake too, we can discuss a little bit later, but they're probably winners in some respect. The question for us investors is, is Palantir the clear winner here? Or is maybe a Snowflake the clear winner? Or multiple of these are going to win. After everything that we just spoke about, there is a really strong bull case for this company because what they're doing is the future. Say you have one really smart guy, but he can only do so much in a day. You can then amplify the work of that one person if they can oversee it through this AI. It's incredibly valuable. The work that they are doing adds a tremendous amount of value, efficiency to the companies that use the software. If you're going to invest in this industry, the company that has a majority of their money coming from government contracts is a safer bet in that sense because the government won't legislate ever to remove its own power. Palantir will continue to make money for years. I don't think they're failing anytime soon. This is the good thing about Palantir that they've been around for like 15 years or so. They're not going anywhere. They're not going bankrupt. So even if your stock price drops, it might actually return because they've survived a hell of a long time. They're not a startup in the conventional sense of the word. You have to also be okay with the fact that they were funded by the CIA and that the software that they make is incredibly powerful. And there's potential downsides to that. With a different CEO, I might trust more that the company is actively trying to do the right thing. There's a million reasons why you might not want to be truthful. An example, in the Starship update that Elon Musk did, someone specifically asked him, what other contracts do you have? And the way Elon Musk handled that question was, he said, well, this is what we've got and this is what we've got. There's some other contracts that we have, but we don't want to ruin their announcement. So those things will come out at a certain time and we're going to give them the opportunity to say that. Totally understandable. Under NDA, I understand. I and mean, then we'll wait and see at the other companies. The way that this guy answers questions is very, very different. We should do a video that breaks down CEOs. Actually, this is good to throw to the Discord. But guys, what CEOs do you want to see? Let's just put them in that little yeah. clip. We're going to cover yeah. a whole episode on different CEOs. Different like, CEOs. like you said, watch their clips. See who we believe. Even Mark Frommeyer. Do we believe Mark, what he's Mark saying? Well, yeah, Mark Frommeyer's agreement. So with this particular CEO, I don't trust what he's saying. And I'm not saying it's necessarily negative because like, like you saw in the article, he's mentioning certain things are government contracts on the NDA. But I also feel like that's a really easy place to hide behind. As an editor, I probably watched in the tens of thousands of hours of people talking. This is what I do. I watch people talk and I try to find the bits that show the character of a person. I also watch a lot of those body language experts and just watching the last earnings call, there was a ton of red flags. I do want to show you two moments in the video back to back of him answering one question and then answering another question. And you see if you can spot a difference in his body language. This is the same first question that the guy was asking him about stock dilution. Look at his position in the room as the question's being asked. Count your shareholder, Chase P. He's walking forward. Yeah, thanks so much for fielding my question. I really Okay, hands are going in the pockets. One of the things that people do when they're uncomfortable is they hide, right? You hide your hands, you fidget. Watch his eye line when the word stock dilution is said. <laughs> when the guy says the word stock dilution. The most negative sentiment I hear regarding Palantir is in regards to the dilution of shares outstanding. When you're in an uncomfortable situation and someone asks <laughs> you something uncomfortable, the tendency is to look down. You don't want to face it. Also, he's been on camera a lot. This is a guy that has done thousands and thousands of interviews. So he caught himself and now he's going to refocus and engage with the guy. Over the past uh, 12 18 months, walking primarily forward. Primarily in relation to... Um, okay, stock. right there what you saw in his mouth. Okay. And primarily in relation to... That right there. There's something called micro expressions and they're expressions that flash on our face sometimes for like a half a second. Yeah, Literally. That's not a micro, that's, that's a macro expression is, right there. This face like this is it's it's showing what he thinks he's uncomfortable with this and he's now thinking how am i going to answer this guy this guy is speaking for millions of other investors i'm on live tv he's really uncomfortable but i gotta say he's he's holding it down he's also now walking forward to the guy being like i'm ready let's engage so the guy will finish his question and you'll see so there's the micro expression. Um, stock-based compensation that's occurred other than the remaining shares to be vested that have already been announced can we expect further dilution and share offerings going forward or is it kind of reasonable to... Did you assume... see that? Did you see that little nod? That's a yes and a no. That's him saying maybe. Like he's not saying <laughs> no, but he's not saying yes. I mean, this, is... Uh, this is funny. Sonny's going to sh** all over us in that's, the comments right great. now. So let's just go back so and look at that in real majority time. Of the okay. offerings going forward, or is it kind of reasonable to... Okay, right there. Is there offerings going forward? He give a yes and a no and kind of one assume nod? that uh, the majority of this was from the IPO process and sort of a one-time uh, event for the company. 
Once again, thanks and congratulations on all the hard work and business developments. Thank you, and I really appreciate you. Yeah, I mean, you could even pause it there. It doesn't even sound sincere, this thank you. I really appreciate you. I didn't I didn't believe that part of it. I think he was kind of caught off guard. It's like he knew the question was coming, but he wasn't really prepared when it came, and he answers the question. And him saying thank you for being an investor, I think that tells you the most important thing on his mind. We need investors. And the second question that I want to show you, he also is talking about investing. And it's a moment that actually made me like him. So I'll show you. Yeah, this is all interesting stuff, definitely. The thing is, Carp has so many of these expressions. He's like a, he's like a smorgasbord of yes, these expressions. Yes, yes. Like Mark Zuckerberg is, he doesn't give you any of this. You know who else? Pete Buttigieg is freakishly <laughs> good at just blinking. Right. And not reacting. <laughs> Politicians are really good at this stuff. So good. Also, as investors, and we can expand on this in this like CEO video. This is great for us because he can't hide what he thinks. You know that yeah. this is how he is, man. <laughs> you know? Watch, okay, so he says. Thank you, and um, I really appreciate you, uh, investors. Uh, thanks for investing. I think he really believes that. Thank you for investing. Now, the second yeah. question, very different answer. This is another question, forward-looking. Uh, give us a little bit of visibility into the nature of those investments. Is it just sales headcount? Is it the forward deployed engineers? Um, how should we think about where those dollars are being deployed? Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. And um, so actually, to, to my perspective, they're very much linked. Our primary investment in growth is product, is investment in product. And we're doing a number of things in product. The things we've talked about at general. Okay, the answer doesn't even matter. The point is. Well, he went right into it because he was very confident about it. He was very yeah. confident. He understands how to correctly answer a question, which is why for me, it raises a red flag when he doesn't. And this is a really nice interaction that he had. This is a guy who asked the question. And then at the end of the question, he just says, hey, you know, thank you. Again, thank you for taking my question. And thank you for allowing a retail investor like myself to have a seat at the table. It's much appreciated, doesn't go unnoticed. Okay, but even before he answers, I just want to play that again. Look at the corner of his mouth. You can see the smile being generated. Again, thank you for talk. taking my question, and thank you for allowing a retail investor like myself to have a seat at the table. It's much appreciated, doesn't go unnoticed. There it is. See myself as a retail investor. <laughs> this is clearly different. Before the previous one, when he's talking to the retail invest, he's looking down, he's looking all around. It's yeah. like left and right, never, never direct. Walking back. This is more of a layup. Oh, it was an easy one, and he was he was relieved. Yeah. Now, someone like Elon Musk, you don't get that. Someone like Steve Jobs, you never got that. You couldn't yeah, ask yeah, Steve yeah, Jobs yeah. an uncomfortable question. He would just tell you the truth. He doesn't care what you think. <laughs> what is nice is if you watch an interview with this guy and you have money in it. He's going to answer the question even if he doesn't answer the question. Right, even if he's not answering the question. Just he, listen to the first thing that he says to this guy. Again, thank you for taking my question and thank you for allowing a retail investor like myself to have a seat at the table. It's much appreciated. There's a smile. I see myself as a retail investor <laughs> and I have all my assets in Palantir. So I'm very happy to meet another retail investor. Uh, hope, in uh, any case. Um, uh, um, okay, now he's gonna stumble and fumble and bumble, but he was also really vulnerable with us just now. He said, I consider myself a retail investor. That's him, I think, on some level admitting like, I don't know how I got to be this like, you know, <laughs> I don't guy. Know, yeah. I'm just like you. He's in a tough position. I wanna go to some positives. He's in a tough position because how do you explain to somebody that I have all this data and this giant Excel spreadsheet, it's not sexy. So maybe that could be a possible excuse for him why he goes on these philosophical rants. Right. He almost goes on a philosophical journey with us about data and how important it is and all these things when analysts just wants to know how much money we're going to make, right? So, But then I'm reminded of what our boy Alex said. If someone cannot explain to you what it is, like you're a German shepherd that speaks Spanish, if you can't be clear and simple and be visual, then you're not as researched on the topic at hand or you're deliberately trying to mislead people. Personally, with him, if what Alex is saying is right and those are the only two options, I would say it's a, probably a combination of both. I think there is a certain level of this that he himself knows he's not qualified to speak on because he's not the tech guy. And I think another part of it is there is a negative stigma attached to working for the government, especially in this particular field of data and privacy, and he's trying to walk that line. I do agree. He's got a really tough position in terms of how he presents what he does to the public in a way that makes them want to invest in this company. So I got to say, with everything that I've said, everything I've shown, kudos to that guy, man, because he built a company based on something that's not really like the most popular thing, and he's still getting people to be on board. He's created a cult type following like a Tesla, like an FUV, which is really important for a company at that level. And again, Again, it doesn't mean that I'm bearish on them because I do think that like this company probably will 10x. The point is there's gonna be lots of players, Google, Snowflake, Palantir, 
maybe Apple, Amazon, whatever. There's going to be a bunch of players and Palantir can easily have a much larger market cap from here on in. And to that point, let's end this with why we are bullish on Palantir because it feels like we've been too negative. I don't see what we're doing as being negative. I think it's really important. Well, I think, I think it's going to be interpreted by some of the Palantir community in the comments below probably mm -hmm. that we are on the internet who don't know anything about anything and join our discord by the way <laughs> if you actually want to talk to us legitimately and talk to the community about palantir and maybe go over the bull case the bear case and, and be a legitimate investor come join us what we're doing here is a live version of what happens on the discord i think i would be foolish to not try to dismantle my own bull case on a company because like the tenth said, man tenth man thing this is about being honest about a company. At the end of the day, I spent $25,000 on Palantir. I want them to succeed. Yeah. But I do want to show why there are some positives to this. One, the stock is down. It's basically right at the bottom of where it started. We're at the bottom. So if you're ever thinking about buying Palantir, this is probably the time to buy Palantir. Even if it goes lower, this is still a great time to DCA into Palantir. Bottom line. Financials, look at this. 2018, 595 million to 742 million to now a billion, right? And we're expecting it's 20x from here. We've gone from a company, we crossed the billion dollar gap revenue market. There is no reason this company should not be 20 times bigger. Basically, he's saying they should be 20 times bigger in terms of revenue. I think that's what he's pointing out here. If you believe Carp at his word on what he's saying, that they're going to be 20 times bigger, is it a bad investment? Because you know your stock price is probably going to go up. If their revenue does go up 20x, maybe it's a decade, but it doesn't seem like I'll lose on this investment if I hold it. This up to 44, back down to 10 is exactly what happened with FUV when it was like up to 36 and it's back now. You get to buy it at that price, except you have a year's worth more information. But to that point, in one of Amit's most recent interviews, as we segue to the next segment, this is a good time to remind you that we have a Patreon. We have multiple levels of support supporter fan super fan and the investor level it starts at a dollar 420 799 you get different benefits all of them include the free discord it's a great reading ground for different topics and we would love to see you there where is it this guy the investment banker his concern is my concern so i, I guess taking a step back here before getting into it i'm a bull I, i'm not 100 percent bearish on the company what i am bearish on is that i feel like the return opportunity for Palantir is a lot less limited, is, is a lot more limited than what people think it could be. Okay. And it's simply a function of primarily what management has said, what management has told us. This is where I have a problem. Carp said, and he kind of reiterated this in his last interview, but in an interview a while back, he said he sees that this company should be at least 20 times, I don't know, he didn't say at least, it should be like 20 times bigger. Mm -hmm. And you and I discussed, we, we're pretty confident that's on a revenue basis. Mm -hmm. So if you take the 1 billion in revenue they had in 2020 and say 20 times that, that's 20 billion in revenue. I'm assuming this is 10 years out, so 2030. Yep. So call it 20 billion in revenue in 2030. Or he could have been talking about 2021 revenue of like 1.5 billion. They've estimated for 1.527 billion. 20 times that is 30 billion. So I like to say, let's cut the difference. 20 billion in 2030 or 30 billion in 2030. Let's just go right down the middle and call it 25 billion. Right. So that's my base case assumption. And I say that because why do, why would I believe a bull case where we can grow up 40% when that's not Carp's own vision. And then he paired it back in his last interview. And then he said before he was like, there's no reason this company shouldn't be 20 times larger. Then he said, should be 10 to 20 times larger. I know these right. are just going to be arbitrary. I know these multiples can be arbitrary. Like right. you just can be talking and giving a range. He's not really thinking about it in terms of investor perspective, just maybe more of like an entire company. But there's a reason he didn't say 50 and he said 20. So there's some merit there, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. There's definitely some like merit. If he said 50, we would be like, oh, he's talking in hyperbole, but that's not sort of what's going on. Exactly, exactly. So but what I'm trying to get at is why believe a gross story that's more than what he even thinks the company can get to. So 20, if you take 25 billion in 2030, and they get 1.5 billion in 2021. That's a 36% growth rate. That's my bull case. The whole bull case, like I can go into this formula here. The whole bull case is saying, take 25 billion in 2030, and then divide that by the 2021 expected revenue. And there's nine years between the period of 2021 to 2030. You take 2030 minus 2021, that's nine year difference. Right. And then you minus one. So that gets you to a compounded annual growth rate of revenue of 36%. That's the bull case. So why believe, I always question, why believe anything more than that? If Carp himself sees that's where the company's potential can get to.
Yeah, I agree that, look, we should have maybe not the bull case, but the sort of the base case to bull case somewhere in that range of that is probably what's going to occur. So that's what people are hoping that maybe CARP is the guy to take us to the 40, 50 percent growth rate, just like Elon took us a little bit beyond that at this point. I'm telling you, it's just boots on the ground is harder than someone buying a complete software product from you. They need to send real people out to all these different places. So growing past 36%, it might actually be a challenge going forward. But I like the fact that he's just assuming, let's take Carp at his word. Let's see what this plays out to, assuming Carp is right. All, all the facts here are pointing at, you might go down a little bit more, but am I DCAing? No, I'm not. I'm still doing research on Palantir and I have a thousand shares. Right. Both say Palantir could be the answer to the problems that governments and commercial customers face in successfully integrating large scale. This is actually important. They are yeah. actually really good at large scale. Disparate data in a cohesive and coherent manner to gain insight and drive actions. Palantir has a strong government business and is diversifying into potentially higher margin commercial markets, which they are. It could become the data operating system for companies and industries. So that's the bulls. And the bears, bears say Palantir solutions are aimed at resolving sophisticated large scale data problems, which may only develop into a niche market. And that was my point on that they have to send engineers out, but they are developing new systems, Foundry, I'm not sure if Gotham does this, but Foundry does where it's more modular. Yeah. And he did say that, that his number one focus in the middle of that word salad with that one investor. <laughs> There's analyst, a lot of words in here. In the middle of that, he did say that the focus is on mobility. Yeah, it's back to it's back to the beginning, baby. Right. This is a do-over. And what you're looking at is a potential, just if it goes back to its all-time high, 308% return. A lot of growth companies like Palantir were smashed. So my final thoughts are that if you were even playing this in the short term, a year or two, when the growth company switch turns back on, yeah. someone like Palantir is just going to shoot a 50%. If you're invested in Palantir, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell to be notified when we drop new videos and join the Discord. And I am sure if you've gotten this far in the video, you have something to say to me and Vitaly.